Good evening, everyone. Oh my goodness. We're so excited to have you here. This is Sky Observer's Hangout. Welcome to the Don't Observatory at the Other Planetarium. My name is Michelle, and I'm the Director of Public Observing here, and I have someone else with me here today. Yes, hello, everybody. My name is Hunter, Public Observing Educator here at the Adler. So excited to be uh, joining you here tonight for uh, Sky Observer's Hangout. Hey, guys, want to get right to it? It's actually clear. I want to show you the comet. We want to get to it right away. I think, yeah, I think yeah, we should speed right ahead, full speed ahead, yep. and uh, we'll make sure to answer all of your questions and things when those times come. Absolutely. But I'm going to get the screen sharing and get you a live view of the comet. Here. And then we're going to say hi to all of you. So if you are just now joining us, tell us in the chat, where are you joining us from? We're in Chicago. We know that you're not all in Chicago, um, but I want to see, uh, there it is. There it is. Oh my God. Oh, we are so excited. We, we were dreading the, the clouds that may have come in. So we are uh, showing an actual live, real, honest to goodness image, video actually, from the telescope that's right behind us. Um, and do you want to uh, move the camera up so we can show our- Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. So we're really excited to be joining you. This is actually the first time we have been able to see anything through this telescope since November. So it has been many months yeah. in the waiting. And I mean, it couldn't have chose a better night to be clear. The close approach of this comet, you know, the closest it'll be to Earth before it starts uh, heading away into the outer solar system. I mean, it couldn't be better. And you can see the big telescope behind us that's pointed up at it right now. One thing you may want to notice in the video, um, if you can see it, is that there's a star on the lower part of the image. Look at what the comet is doing relative to that star. Actually, notice what the star is doing. It's slowly moving off the screen. That's because the comet is moving, and it's actually hauling right now. Um, it's not streaking across the sky, but it's moving, and that's actually why that star image was a little bit blurry. It's because the comet is moving a little quickly for the camera, which is taking about a four-second exposure image. So it's taking a four second exposure and refreshing and taking another four second exposure. So right now there's no, of course, there's no bright stars visible in the frame, but that's okay. Well, but so, yeah, like some might come in the frame here. Yeah, you are looking at a live image from our 24 inch plane wave telescope here at the Don't Observatory at the Abbott Planetarium. We want to say hello to several of you. We know you've been saying hi to us. So who do we have here, Hunter? Who do you see there? Yeah, I'm seeing tons of folks uh, joining from all kinds of different places, which is so exciting. You know, we may be here in Chicago and Illinois, but we've got folks joining from Wisconsin, New York, Australia, Rhode Island, Boston, Virginia, some local folks here in Chicago, Louisville, Phoenix, San Diego, all over the place. So we're so excited that you all can come here and join us today. And, you know, I think we were so excited to get this live view up at the beginning that um, I wanted to make sure that we went over a couple of things. If you have any questions in the chat today, you can leave those. Um, uh, you, well, feel free to leave those in the chat. We'll be getting to um, as many of those as we can get to tonight. Um, we've also got our friend Geza helping us out, an astronomer here at the museum. You'll see a little blue wrench next to his name. That's how you'll know that that's Geza in the chat. Um, and then we also have a Bella joining us. You'll see um, she has the uh, Adler Planetarium logo next to her. She'll be helping us out in the chat as well, getting those questions to us. So make sure to leave those in the chat if you have any about this comment tonight. Yes. And so we know you've got questions. We're, if you don't mind, we're going to leave the video up um, and just uh, let you enjoy the comment. So I hope you don't mind. Figure that's why you're here, right? So uh, let's get to some of your questions. Okay, here we go. Is there any chance that we're gonna see this comet with the naked eye? Actually, the person indicated a, a town, but um, it could be any town, but it was Addison, Illinois, it was mentioned uh, with the light pollution. It's, yeah, it's gonna be pretty tough, right? So what, we, what we're seeing right now through the telescope is um, not only through a 24 inch telescope, but also that long exposure, like you mentioned earlier. So the camera is staying open, collecting light for four seconds, which is a little different than how our eyes work. So even if you were in the darkest sight in the world, this comet is still just barely uh, potentially visible by the naked eye. So pretty much anywhere in the United States, I would say that we're probably gonna have too much light pollution to uh, see with the naked eye, which is why we wanted to bring you this fantastic telescope view of it tonight. Exactly, and so that's, that's a really great point. And even if you were under an amazingly dark sky, the moon's up right now. And no, that, uh, is, yeah. that is also providing some light pollution so even if you were out where it was away from any lights at all, you're still gonna have the moon. You're gonna have to know exactly where to look. 
um, in order to see this thing. And we'll show you where it is in the sky in just a sec. But um, but so this, this is our long-winded answer of saying no. <laughs> You're not going to see it with the naked eye. Um, all right, what's our next question? Ooh, let's see. So one person asked, relative to the North Star, is the comet up, down, left, or right? So good question, because it actually is, uh, it is pretty close to the North Star in the sky yeah. right now. So it's actually a, a good reference point to use tonight. Well, should we share the screen? We'll go away from the comet view for just a second, but we want to show you a sky map as to where exactly it is in the sky right now. And so uh, Hunter is going to, yep, we're sharing Stellarium. So you can follow us online if you want to go to this site yourself. It's completely free. Stellarium, S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M hyphen web dot org. And so we've got this set for right now. Um, and so where the comet is, if you use the cursor. Absolutely. And yep. So you can see it's highlighted here in the center. You can see the Little Dipper is kind of right below it. Another good reference point, one of the, the closer bright constellations to it right now. And uh, if you want to point out where Polaris oh, is. Yes. So down right there. Yep, you can there see you right go. here, the little tip of the. Yep, yep. Right there so is our North Star. So it's basically up from Polaris. So Polaris is due north, go up and over just a little bit. So it's about 20 degrees away from Polaris. Um, and a way that you can measure that, if you're going, I don't know how far away 20 degrees is. Actually, you do have measurement tools. I want you to all, I know we can't see you, but we know you're out there. Make fists. Hold them out at arm's length. A fist held out at arm's length on, uh, on the sky, the bottom to the top of your fist is 10 degrees of sky. So to make 20 degrees of sky, 10, 20. And so the bottom of one fist to the top of your other fist is 20 degrees. So that's about how far away the comet is from Polaris as we see it in the sky. Um, and so wherever you are, the, the angle might be slightly different. If you're farther east of here mm -hmm. or farther west of here, it, you're, it's going to be a little bit different. The time zone is going to be a little different. And so where exactly it is. Uh, relative to Polaris is going to be slightly different for you. Yes, very um, true. Yeah. And I, you know, thinking back to how far away some of our viewers were coming, joining from tonight, uh, especially if you're coming from Australia today, right? It's a very different time of day there right now. So I would encourage using something like Stellarium Web on your own at home as well. Um, this is totally free in browser and it'll um, check your location, look at what time it is and give you a, a totally lined view of what the sky looks like. So that's really the best way to know for exactly where you are. Exactly. And by the way, if anyone is watching from Australia, hey, welcome. Unfortunately, you can't see the comment right now. So, <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> that, again, that's, that's why we're here today, right? We're here. To, yeah. Yep, so we're back live with the comment. There it is. All right, so uh, what does it look like to the eye? So you saw it through the telescope earlier. Yeah. So what did it look like to you? Yeah, so we saw it through the telescope a little bit earlier. And there's a, there's a couple of big differences that you have when um, looking at it with your natural eye through the telescope rather than using the camera. So one of those big things that we mentioned is that exposure time, right? So here with the camera that we have, we can do longer exposures, the light stays open for longer, um, and so it, it gathers more light in that time frame. So that helps a lot. Another thing that's a little different is you'll notice one thing that I see was brought up is about the green color of this comet that we're seeing, and that's a name that we've seen a lot recently. Green Comet has been kind of a, a pseudonym that, has, that it's taken up. Um, and the cameras are much better at seeing those colors than our eyes are. So when we looked through it, it was real, it was much fainter than we see here. You wouldn't have seen such a clear, bright middle part and very little color, essentially no color um, when looking at it with the naked eye. And that was even through um, this big telescope here. Yeah, I could, I, I kept saying, I can convince myself that I saw green, but I knew I should be looking for green. So that probably wasn't a good a good uh, reference point to be able to do it. So here you're actually seeing a, a just a, a bit of green. We did um, uh, try to focus this as best we can. So you're not going to see a bright, a, a single bright spot. This is uh, stars are going to be pinpoints. This is spread out just a little bit. Um, but yeah, this is 
this is brighter than what we saw through the telescope with our eyes. Absolutely. And I like that point of how it's uh, spread out a little bit on the screen, right? It's not a single point of light. And if we do end up seeing a, a star that it passes by, you'll, you'll be able to tell a, a pretty big difference between the two. But I'd love to talk about like, okay, not only can we see this like sort of disc in the center, but you can see that it kind of extends out a little bit further than that, right? There's this sort of aura around it. And that's something that's so interesting about comets and something that's so unique about them. So what, what is that sort of, you know, hazy outside? Yeah, see? yeah. So comets are basically made that you can say there are three parts to a comet really there's just one part but uh all the rest of the parts come from the one so the one main part is the dirty dusty snowball itself we call that the nucleus and the nucleus for this comet i believe is less than a half a mile wide so it's it's not big um, okay, that was another question that was in the chat yeah yep so, yeah, yeah, so about half a mile uh less than half a mile wide um and so when comets get closer to the sun they heat up Right, so uh, they give off the 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 ices and dust and gas and stuff that that the comet is made of, and that stuff spreads out. And if it's a, this cloud of stuff around the nucleus, we call that the coma. Coma is Latin for hair, and basically the original name for comets to some folks way back when was hairy star. Um, so it looked like kind of a dot with a fuzzy bit around it. So the coma is the, 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 the stuff that's around the comet that came off the comet. Then that stuff starts to trail behind the comet. And when you see that, that's the tail of the comet. But we really can't see a tail easily for this one. The tail is thin. Mm -hmm. And so it is even hard for our telescope to pick it up. Again, we can kind of convince ourselves that there is a bit of a tail going maybe, maybe down into the left of the of the this in our video by the way just if you're just joining us this is a live video of the comet from a 24 inch telescope at the Abbott Planetarium's Dome Observatory and that's where we are right now it's a little chilly out here right it now. is a little bit chilly <laughs> right now but it's so worth it to have a clear night you know if it was warmer we probably would have clouds honestly so Absolutely. I'm not uh, complaining about that uh, um you know, you mentioned the tail that can that, that comes behind it and how it's pretty thin. And while we can't necessarily see it with the live view here, I will pull up a, a picture that um, that we have here that we'll have. It's, excuse me, I might have to scroll through a few slides really quick. But um, we do have a picture that does a good job of showing some of that um, tail here. And this is also interesting. This is its kind of current location um, in re re reference to the solar system. And we can come back to these if you... If oh, yes, know. absolutely. But yes. this is the one that I wanted to show that really gives a good example of that tail. Now, there's actually two different tails that come off of a comet. The one long one that we are seeing here, it's actually mostly dust, right? Like that, that one's not so much of the gas, like that coma that you're seeing. And then we've got another one here that would be the gas one, but it's really, really faint. Yeah. Um, but you can get an idea of that tail that's being pushed behind it. Exactly. Kudos and special shout out to our colleague, Nick Lake, who took this picture last night. From Chicago. I mean, absolutely spectacular. Yeah, really, really nice job. And but I wanted to show that to give an example of that tail that it has there. And you can see that it kind of looks like a curtain behind the comet. And that's because he was taking several pictures and putting them together, stacking them together. And so there is a bit of trailing from the stars because the comet was moving as he was taking those pictures. Um, so it was, it's pretty amazing to be yeah, able to see that. Really yeah. awesome picture. So I wanted to share that to kind of give a better idea, idea of what those tails exactly. look like. So, um, uh, there's another question. How far is the comet from earth right now? Mm -hmm. About 26 million miles away. Yeah. So this is the closest it will be to earth, right? So after this, it will be, um, sort of, I guess in that picture, you saw there was the kind of the plane of the solar system. It's passing our orbit now, and then it will be going sort of past us and getting further and further away potentially to, to actually never come back near us. Right. Um, it, its orbit was um, sort of perturbed in this in this trip into the inner solar system, um, likely by one of the, the gas giants as it was coming in. And now, you know, this number that we've heard a lot is the last time that it was probably here, our best estimate based on the orbits is about 50,000 years ago, definitely in the tens of thousands of years. But it's looking like now it might be uh, sent out of the solar system. And if, if not that, at least like a, a couple million years before it returns to Earth. Yeah, yeah, we're not quite sure that it's kind of on the cusp of uh, does it come back, but but in a really long time, or does it escape our solar system completely? Yeah, yet to be determined. We may have to wait a million years to find out. Exactly. Um, so, uh, and but the the neat thing is what affected its its orbit is uh, gravity of the planet Jupiter. So uh, that is something that I just find endlessly 
fascinating. So, all right, we oh we have a special question. My six year old my six year old son Mars has a question. How long has this comet been traveling, and where has it been for the last fifty thousand years? Wow, what excellent questions, That's a great right? Question. I mean, so the first one here: How long has this comet been traveling? So, I mean, these are really remnants of, of the early formation of the solar system, right? So you gotta go look all the way back to, you know, 4.6 billion years ago when our solar system is forming to see when this comet is gonna start forming. And it's probably been traveling around since then. Yeah, so this likely is a comet from uh, what's called the Oort cloud, O-O-R-T, Oort cloud. We've never seen a comet in the Oort cloud. We've seen comets that we think come from the Oort cloud, especially when you're thinking of something that's maybe uh, less than half a mile wide and we're talking just billions and billions and billions of miles away, you're not going to see the, the iceberg itself that far away. Um, so when they come close enough to us, they can trace back their orbits and kind of get a sense of where they came from. Um, and so this one we think came from the Oort cloud. And um, so, but it likely was, as Hunter said, was a, was a remnant of the formation of the solar system. So it's been around for billions of years. Billions and billions of years, really yep. incredible. I mean, really as long as, as the earth essentially, you know? Exactly. Um, exactly. And even, even the sun. And it may not have been in the same orbit that whole time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's orbit, something perturbed it and caused it to, to come this direction, which we got lucky. And, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, we happen to be alive in the time of our solar system where we get the one chance to see this particular comet. It's pretty exactly. cool. Um, so where has this comet been for the last 50,000 years? On its way in from the Oort cloud. Mm -hmm. it, it, that orbit is, or the, the, the distance is that far that it has been taking that long to yeah. actually get here. To give you an idea of, of how far away the Oort cloud is, right? And the comets are also traveling slower when they're that far out in that orbit, right? So it gets close to the sun, that heavy gravity makes it speed up. So it's traveling a little faster now than it would have been over the last 50,000 years. The Oort cloud, that region of the sky that it originates in, doesn't even start until 2,000 times further away from the sun than the Earth is. So I have the miles of 186 billion miles from the sun is when the Oort cloud starts. They think it might go all the way as far as like almost halfway to, to, our near, to the nearest star to us. So the Oort cloud is incredibly distant, hence why we haven't been able to see these objects. And it's been living out there um, this whole time. It's a really fascinating region of space and one that it's probably gonna take a long time for us to really be able to discover very much about. Um, the closest thing we have to it right now is uh, the Voyager spacecrafts. Um, those are way past any of the planets, right? They've gone way past Pluto at this point. And Voyager 1 is currently traveling at 38,000 miles an hour. It's not going to reach the Oort cloud for another 300 years. So it's really far away, and it's going to take a long time for us to really be able to do more research on it. It's really fascinating. By the way, I'm looking at the video. Of, we've got a screen over here. If you see me looking over in this direction, we've got a screen that we're looking at. There is a star that's next to the comet, a little bit to the right. Depending on the resolution that you're getting on your end, you may not see it. But we can see it. And so this thing, uh, there is a dim star that is uh, just a tiny bit to the right and now slightly below um, the comet. So you want me to you think get right in here? Is yeah. Yeah. About? Oh, that's real. That's a very yeah. dim one. I, can, I didn't really notice Yes, yeah, so the comet's been moving. So it's been moving past that, or, uh, past that background star. So there you go. Anyway, so yeah, that's what I keep looking at over here, just making sure that the camera was still working and still moving, so, and the comet's still moving. All right. How fast is this comet traveling? Ooh, good question. So it is constantly changing, but I did specifically check how fast it was going today. Good. Thank Can goodness. So um, <laughs> it is going, okay, I have to find my number here. Sorry. See, Got it written this, down somewhere. Hey, Mars, we know you're out there. Let it be known. You don't have to memorize everything. We, we, write, we write stuff down. Oh, yeah. Too many, too many numbers to remember all of them. <laughs> it's currently traveling 128,000 miles an hour. Really, really fast. Wow. Crazy. Wow. All right. I think we did have some from up here earlier. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, what focus are we using for the current video feed? So uh, the telescope, uh, we don't have an IP. So the camera is hooked up directly to the telescope. Um, but this is kind of, you can could, you could say it's a similar image to what we did have earlier um, when we did have an eyepiece. So 
for the sake of conversation to attach a number to it, you can say that we have this magnified about a hundred times ish, just round numbers. Um, so this, this is, this is about what we were looking at. So, and that's the type of IPs that we had in there. So I just did a little mental calculation in my head. So yeah, about a hundred times magnification. So. Another question that we have here um, is where is it in relation to the moon? I so I, I would say go back to Stellarium for that. Yeah, that'll do the best job of, of giving us that example. So I'll zoom out a little bit here and you can kind of see where the moon is. It's pretty high in the sky right now. Um, so it's a pretty good distance away from the moon. It's looking like probably about 30 degrees yep. now, maybe yep. um, away. And then, you know, heading towards Polaris, it's actually kind of right in between the moon and Polaris here, right? So that's actually kind of a good way to get an idea of where it is. You can see Polaris, this star, the moon there, that's kind of about one third of the way in, in, in between those. Yep. So hopefully that helps give you a better idea of where, where it is in relation to the moon, which is obviously such a, a recognizable object. Exactly. And the moon's light is causing some light pollution. So if, if we mentioned it earlier, but if, you, if you're just joining us, by the way, welcome. Ooh, well, look at the star. Oh, there you go. That's a nice bright one. You should be able to see that. So you'll see yeah. coming from right above the, the comet here, we've got this bright point coming. Now, the bright point, well, it looks like that's what's moving, right? That's a, a star that we're seeing pass through. Um, it's actually going to be going much slower than the comet is. We just have the telescope tracked to the comet. So the telescope is slowly moving to follow the path yep. that the comet is taking. Yeah, so the comet, we normally, if we were following the star, the star is moving basically at the rate that the Earth is rotating. So uh, this comet is moving faster than that. So that's why we can, it looks like the star is, is doing the moving, but it's really the comet that's doing the moving in our sky, which is so cool. Anyway, um, we, we're just, we're geeking out here. We really are. It's, it's just beyond cool. To be I know. Yeah. Like, like I said earlier, it's been so long since I've even like looked up at space. So it's just so excited to, to be able to come back and to have such a, such a unique object that we're looking at. Yeah. Yep. It's yep. really exciting. Yeah. So 120, 128,000 miles, an, miles hour. an hour that the comet is traveling right now. Crazy. Um, now, we'll start slowing down a little bit since it's getting yes. further away from the sun, right? So yep. it's always changing. Even, you know, I'm sure 128,000 isn't exactly right in this exact moment. Um, but I know that was about what it was going when it was at its exact closest approach point. Exactly. So, um, uh, by the way, this is our telescope's first comet. This is the Ooh, first time. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, well, let's talk. You know, we, we ought to look back up at the telescope and highlight it for a second, Ben. I mean, we are so proud of you. Uh, little plane wave, or big plane wave, really. Yeah. Um, first comet that it's seen before. Time. How exciting. The, the, the telescope's been pointed at. It, it got installed just a, a couple of days past three years ago, and we were closed for most of that time. So, yeah, it's super cool to be able to show this to you live. We, we didn't have this capability when we first installed the telescope, so pretty awesome. All right. Um, so any chance of seeing it with a telephoto camera lens or only a powerful telescope? You can use a, a telephoto lens, yes. Um, so we were taking pictures of it earlier with my DSLR camera. We don't have it hooked up to the, uh, to the computer because we wanted to show you the real thing. Um, and so... Um, uh, we did have photos in reserve just in case, um, but yes, and we were taking it with a 50 millimeter uh, telephoto lens, which is basically a 50 millimeter telescope. Yeah, no, um, yeah, exactly. Not yeah. Far from that. Yeah. yeah, and so a if your telephoto lens is even bigger than that, um, so 70 millimeter, 80 millimeter, whatever. Um, yeah, you absolutely can get a picture mm -hmm. of it. You just need to be able to adjust the exposure time on your on your camera to take like a three four five second photo mm -hmm. and um ooh, there's another star oh yeah, yeah um, I get there. <laughs> so um the other thing is you need to adjust the um uh, uh the iso the iso to somewhere around iso 800 or, or 1600 something like that by the way if you don't have a dslr camera don't worry about, about <laughs> these numbers they'll make no sense um but you just have to adjust the settings to be able to get it bright enough and the exposure time long enough to be able to get um a view of the comet mm -hmm. yes you can take a picture of it with just a dslr camera 
Now, I will say one thing that might be a little bit tough with this. Um, once you've got it in view, you can get a good picture of it. But locating it in the sky will definitely be a, um, a little bit more of a challenge for sure. Yeah. Um, so definitely encourage you to look up, you know, something like Stellarium, see what stars are around it so that you can have a frame of reference when trying to locate it. That's going to be really helpful. I need to move. Sorry, I'm looking at the screen. I need, oh, to, move, the roof's coming in. I need to move the roof a little bit. So give me just a second. Okay. So while the telescope's automated, the roof is not. So we've got to adjust the roof manually to make sure it stays in view. Um, yep. Hope that wasn't too loud on camera. Apologies if you could hear it. But but not apologies because that's cool too. Yeah, that actually changed the view uh, yeah. quite significantly. You yeah. can see that the sky's a lot darker in the background. There. Yeah, exactly. So we have a couple. We have some red lights on it here. You can see those in the background. Hunter has an awesome video on our on our social media channels about why are the lights red. Um, so go check that out because it's really awesome. Um, but the rig light is on also, which actually isn't really uh, causing a, a bad view. But the shutters we have the roof has shutters that open and close and there's a metal strip on either side of the of the open shutters and so when light reflects off of that and then reflects into the telescope that's when the view can kind of get messed up a little bit but yeah you, you might have seen that like the the background before you moved the roof almost looked a little bit red it was kind of tinted a little red it was yep. definitely much brighter looking um, so we just had to adjust it exactly. sure it's a good feeling. yep so how are comets formed well comets form from uh, they form when the solar system forms so our solar system formed from a giant cloud of gas and dust um, the gas in these gas clouds, most of it is hydrogen. There's other stuff in there too. Um, dust, think smoke particle sized stuff. Um, but something caused that cloud to start spinning and flattening. And then something caused the center of that cloud to start collapsing. We actually don't totally understand the, the whole collapse part in the middle uh, uh, part of it, some of the details were related to that. But we've, we see this happen elsewhere. Um, so we can pretty well imply that this is how our solar system formed, where that cloud collapsed in the center that formed our sun. And our sun was left with this disk of stuff around it. And the disk of stuff started clumping together. And the big clumps basically were the planets. Well, if the clumps were, were close enough to the sun, well, it was too warm. You're left with rocky stuff. If they're far from the sun, they're cold. And then you can be left with icy stuff. And so comets likely formed far from the sun where it was cold enough that ices could form around some of, around and in some of these clumps or get incorporated into, into these clumps. And if you've got a comet-sized clump, you've got yourself a comet. Yeah, I think a good way to describe them is almost like, they're almost like the really far away leftovers from the formation of the solar system, right? They weren't in, the, they were so far out that they weren't dragged into the planets either, right? The, the gravity of the planets didn't draw them in. So they're just living out there way in the outer solar system. And there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, we really have no idea how many there are. I, I think it's a number that you really oh, can't even imagine. In it's, the, in the, it's probably in the billions. In the billions, billions. Yeah. yeah. It's just an insane number. Now, there's a there's a question. Um, are there any comets that will be visible? And I think we need to go to the next page. Like, oh, yeah. Scroll down. No, it's okay. Um, we know your, your questions are coming in. This is awesome. Bill, you're doing an awesome job moving <laughs> to ask the questions. So are there any comets that will be visible to us in the near future? Yes, but none of them really rise to this level of brightness. I was going to say, I, yeah, I don't think that any comets um, for for this year that are predicted so far are are brighter than this. Now I will say you don't really always know, right? So this comet was just discovered in March of last year, um, and we and it's really difficult to guess how bright they're going to be. The effect of the pass of the sun, how much of that coma is going to be formed, um, is really tough to predict. Um, we know so little about these comets before we start to see them. Um, so it, it's tough to give a, a definite answer, but I will say that, yeah, it looks like this will, will probably be the brightest one that we have this year, at least. Yep. Yeah. And um, we know that everybody's been wondering, why is it green? Why is this comet green? Um, so Geza's probably been answering a bunch of questions. Thank you so much, Geza. We'd love that you do that for us. Um, but uh, just, to, just to reiterate, this particular comet is green because 
but some of the stuff that the comet has given off contains carbon molecules, two atoms of carbon hooked together. Well, ultraviolet light from the sun can break the bond of those two carbon molecules, dissociate those, uh, basically break them apart. And so in the process that gives off green light. And so that's the color that we see. So the comet itself, the nucleus is not green. It's the color of light that we see because those bonds of carbon molecules were broken apart. And this actually leads into another question I see here in the chat really well. How common is it for an asteroid or a comet to appear as a different or bright color, right? So this one's green, but there's the potential for some other colors in comets. Yeah, you can get um, kind of a yellowish white color um, for, the, for the dust. Um, sometimes the gas tail of a comet is blue. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it, it's common for, for that sort of uh, color combination to happen. Um, the green ones, this is the first one that I personally have seen that's, that's green, um, but they've seen others. So they, we, we, uh, we're not surprised by it, it's just neat to see it. So oh, yeah. absolutely. And then another part of this question here is, how common is it for an asteroid to appear as a different color? So asteroids, not so much, right? So asteroids are from much closer in the solar system, right? The asteroid belt is just in between the terrestrial and, and gas planets, right? So it's much closer, much too warm in that region for those ices to stay frozen. So asteroids actually um, don't have a coma like this. They're really more just a, uh, just a big pile of rocks. They're pile of rocks. Sometimes the rocks can be more gray. Sometimes the asteroids can be more red. Um, it depends on the composition of, of the rocks. And so uh, coincidentally, there is a spacecraft from NASA called OSIRIS-REx. And it is on its way back to Earth with a sample of an asteroid that is also an extraordinarily primitive object, meaning from the time of the formation of the solar system, we think. Um, and the asteroid is called Bennu. And this uh, spacecraft is carrying samples of rock from Bennu, and they're going to land on Earth, uh, I believe, in September. So looking forward to uh, scientists getting their hands on that. But asteroids can be different colors, but it's because of the surfaces of, of, those, of those asteroids. Um, there can be asteroids that contain ices. There may be asteroids that are former comets mm -hmm. that have mm -hmm. lost their ices and all that's left is the rubble pile that, uh, that, that is just left over when, mm -hmm. when you don't have any ices left and all you have is the rocky stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's neat to think about some of these things, almost like on a continuum. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, their, their lifespans are, it, we, when we look at these things, we don't often think of them as like constantly changing because, you know, in the moment that we're looking at it, it looks, it looks pretty still, pretty, pretty standard, but they do live such long lives, right? Like we were talking about, that this was four, you know, four and a half billion years ago. So certainly it's changed uh, throughout time, gone through many different phases. Um, it's just hard for us to, you know, really, uh, really see it on a big time scale like that, right? Like that's a, that's a big limitation in astronomy, I guess, is that everything is on such a grand scale. Yeah. Um, so you can't necessarily always watch things, you know, throughout their full lifespan. There is another NASA spacecraft that is on its way to explore, I believe, nine different asteroids. Um, it's going to do flybys of them. Uh, and I think they're going to be adding another one. I think it's the Lucy mission, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, that one launched uh, not too long ago, but it's on its way out to explore um, some asteroids that are in Jupiter's orbit. So yeah, that's uh, another great asteroid connection there. But um, yeah, yeah, these I'm things thinking. like these things like asteroids and comets um, are a uh, are a really good thing. And I know this was another one of the questions that we had down here is like, what can we learn from from things like these comets? And I think you brought this up, like with these asteroids that you can tell that they're pretty important to research, right? We've got tons of NASA missions that are working to find these things. And that is because they are so old, right? A, a, a lot of times the, the material in them might maybe hasn't changed as much as something on Earth, right? We've got all of, all of this geologic activity here that um, really changes a lot of the rocks and things that we have. So by looking at things like these comets and asteroids, it can really help us try and uncover some of the some of the early history of the solar system. Exactly, and sometimes we can tell that a comet has spent um, much of its much of its existence out where it's cold. But then we can see maybe there's some materials that only appear when a comet is heated, 
So maybe it spent some of its lifetime near the sun. Mm -hmm. So that, that happens too. And we can tell that from the chemistry of the materials that, that make up comets. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can almost start to read the history of these things like a book um, based on the materials that they're made of. And just remember, we're seeing light from the sun reflected off of a comet, then that light is coming to us. We're not going to this thing, digging up pieces of it and bringing them back here. Not this one anyway. And we're learning all this stuff, a lot of this stuff from the light that comes to us. The light tells us an awful lot of information. Um, but there's a, a question that came in. What is propelling the comet? And the comet um, probably started off with its own orbit far, 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 far from the sun, probably moving very slowly. Well, maybe a passing star happened to um, uh, slowly go by the, the far reaches of our solar system long, long ago and perturbed a few of these comets and, and sent this one on its 50,000 year journey to get from where it was to where we are right now tonight which is the closest point that it is to Earth and it's in its orbit in the last 50,000 years. And, um, but that's due to uh, basically the sun is, is it's the sun's gravity um, acting on this comet and it is moving its way in. The closer it gets to the sun, the faster it goes. And the farther it gets from the sun, the slower it goes. So this object is affected a lot by the gravity of the sun but also tugged on by Jupiter's gravity. So yeah. Jupiter's gravity has affected its orbit too. Pretty cool. Yes. All right. One other question that I see here in the chat is, um, where is it in relation to the popular constellation? So well, another good question. Go to, that's actually a great question. Because it's really kind of far away. It's not really super close to a lot of them. So you can see here where it is in the sky and I'll zoom in a little bit more. So you can get a sort of an idea of where it is in relation to the little dipper here below it, um, but it is kind of far above it. It's about it's about twenty degrees above the the this star here, Polaris, uh, which is the North Star. Um, so yeah, quite quite a bit away from a lot of the bright constellations, and some of these ones um, are going, that are nearer to it are going to be very faint and pretty tough to make out in the sky. Um, you wouldn't be able to see all of the stars in those constellations. Right, and if you're wondering what the constellation uh, Camillo Cardalis is, and I'm not even 100% certain I'm pronouncing it correctly, <laughs> it's a giraffe. <laughs> so there you go. That's not necessarily one of the ones that you've heard of. Um, yeah, but now I, see, now I see the camel part of the name. That makes sense. Yeah, and they're related. Yeah, um, but Cassiopeia, you can see that over to the, the left side, over mm -hmm. to the west. Um, and actually here in Chicago, if you could move, uh, make, it, make it so that north is straight down oh, to the lowest yeah. part. There you go. So where we are here in the central time zone right here, the comet is directly north, or directly above, higher, about 20 degrees higher than the North Star. Um, so that, that just happens to be where we are. If you're farther to the east, you're going to see it a little bit farther over to the left. If you're farther west, it's going to be a little over to the right and down a little bit. Um, so it is circling around Polaris. It's up all night. But exactly when you go look for it and exactly where you are will determine exactly where you would need to point uh, a good pair of binoculars, probably, a, a, honestly, with the amount of light that's in the sky right now, you probably need a decent-sized telescope in order to see mm -hmm. it. So. Anyway. Um, while we're in this view and not in the in the live camera view, I wanted to answer this other question that we have here. What direction is it moving in? So what's what's its trajectory? Ah, and so as a picture really to so. go back just a little bit. Well, I might actually need to run over the computer really quick because yep. I can only move forward in the slide. Yeah. So while he does that, just to give you a little guided tour of the observatory. So we've got the telescope is behind us that's so pointed at the comet. We've got our the computer that operates the telescope is downstairs below us, one floor below us. We've got a couple screens over here. So we're broadcasting uh, from those screens. Uh, there's a camera hooked to the telescope, which it's the software is on those screens, and that's the screen we were sharing to show you the, the comet view, which we'll get back to in just a second. Oh yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah, so here's the here's the trajectory. Yep. So this gives you an idea of where where it is in its current spot in the solar system. So this is this is for today. 
um, during its closest pass of the Earth. Now you can see that um, all of these planets here, and this is the case with all the planets in the solar system, but they're all kind of on this big um, disk and, that, and it kind of makes sense with the, with the formation of the solar system you were talking about earlier. So they all kind of lie on this flat plane. Comets not so much. So we think the Oort cloud is pretty much a whole sphere that surrounds um, the entire solar system. And you can see that this comet is moving in a very different plane than ours. It's almost kind of a flip 90 degrees sort of. Pretty much. Um, so you can see where it is right now. And the direction that it'll be moving in is actually going, I guess, in, in this view down, but there's not so much up and down in space. South. Uh, south, there you go. <laughs> um, so yes, it will be moving this direction and getting further away from Earth um, and, and, and the rest of this, the inner solar system exactly. um, from here on out. Um, so we've got, yep, live view back to the comet. And if you've been- A really bright star coming in, it looks like. I'd be curious to know what that star is to compare the magnitudes, actually. Oh, that is, that'd be cool. I have to grab my- uh, phone and hang on. I'm going to grab my phone so I can look on a star map. Um, so one way that we measure objects that we look at in the night sky is by uh, a, num a number called magnitude. Um, and so this is a number value that indicates the sort of apparent brightness of an object. So the brightness of an object as it looks um, to your eye. Now, as we said with uh, comets earlier, this is really variable. It's very hard to predict. Um, and so people will essentially record what magnitude they are seeing it at. And the only way to really know that is to compare it to something that is of a known magnitude. Now, stars are going to have very consistent magnitudes. It's always going to be the same. Um, viewing conditions can affect it a little bit, but that shouldn't really be, it shouldn't necessarily go into um, how you consider it. So what we want to do is because this star is a pretty bright one, we can see which one it is and try and compare it, look at the magnitude of that one and see what we think that maybe the, the apparent magnitude of this comet is right now. It's now numbers that we've been seeing recently is about a five magnitude right now, and it will be getting um, nothing but dimmer from here on out. Um, this is the, the should be the brightest day that we see it. Okay, a couple of questions here. So why can't we see the tail? Really good question. Oh, that's a great question. And, and there's actually a, a great answer to that. The tail is so thin. Um, this comet, uh, as it was close, it was closest to the sun about two weeks ago. So that would have been when uh, the sun's heat was acting on it the most and releasing the most stuff. Well, the problem with this comet is it's it's small. There's just not a lot of stuff that's been that's been released by this comet. So while some comets give off lots and lots and lots of stuff, mm -hmm. um, this one just didn't and so it, you don't see um a, a big giant long tail like you do for for some months. yeah so there is a little bit of a tail there you know the, the gases are being pushed away by the solar winds They're, it's just a little bit too faint for us to be able to uh to see it with this telescope right now i think that might be that star right i think so that's about a magnitude around a magnitude five star Okay, and, and a pretty pretty comparable brightness to to that to that star, honestly, especially in the in the nucleus there. So yeah, it makes sense. That I think the I think the five magnitude um, sort of predictions that we've been seeing were pretty spot on, actually. Yeah, really yeah. Um, yeah, that's about right. It, uh, the only reason I'm hesitating a little bit is sometimes the star maps aren't exactly as accurate as the telescope is. The telescope is using um, the most recent uh, um, orbital elements, uh, details, numbers um, for this particular comet. So if, if the phone app hasn't updated with that, then it'd be a little bit off. So I'd say, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty comparable magnitude, um, around magnitude five, um, which is just at the limit pretty much to what the human eye can see. Yeah, technically six is visible, probably not for everybody, but for some people. And uh, definitely, you know, the look that's in a very, very incredibly dark sky, right? So yep. here in Chicago, what, what what is the magnitude that you can typically see with the naked eye here in Chicago? Uh, about three. About three, <laughs> yeah. So you can, it's pretty far away from being uh, from being naked eye visible here. Out, out in the uh, western suburbs where I am, we can get about magnitude four, which is not that good. Um, <laughs> it's better, but not. Um, anyway, if you're just joining us, this is a live video view from the Adler Planetarium's Dome Observatory. My name is Michelle. This is Hunter. Behind the scenes is Bella. She's putting in the questions. 
uh, to us that you are asking. And then Geza, if you see a name with a blue wrench to it, that is our astronomer friend Geza. He is answering your questions from behind the scenes and doing a stellar job, pun intended. Um, <laughs> and don't forget the most important member of tonight's crew, the big telescope that's doing oh, all the hard work for you. us, right? Yeah. Thank you so much, big telescope. <laughs> it just kept a name. I, know, I was going to say, I was trying to think if there was any new name for it. We'll have to come up with something sometime. Maybe if, you have, if you have a suggestion. I was going to say, maybe we'll have to do a poll sometime. I kind of like this idea. Okay, that's something right. to keep in mind for the future. So do all comets have a hard crust surface? Um, yes, but it's probably not, uh, it, it may not be a surface that's sturdy enough to easily stand on. Uh, it's not going to have a lot of gravity because this thing is not going to be made of a huge amount of mass. Um, it will have some gravity, but just not a lot. Um, but the, the, I, I like to think about the interiors of comets. Imagine this. Next time you go get a cappuccino, the density, I mean, our Dodgers no, going, I'm curious. Am I going with yeah, this? Okay. The density of the interior of a comet is similar to the density of cappuccino foam. Oh, wow. Well, and I, you know, that doesn't make sense because we were talking about the trails earlier and one of the big trails you have behind it is, is, a, is a dust trail, right? So there is a lot of really, really fine, um, fine, fine matter in there. Yeah. Um, so when, oh, this is a great question. When will it be completely out of sight for basically everybody? So most powerful telescopes and naked eye and all that. Well, it already isn't naked eye visible because of the, it might've been if you're under an extraordinarily dark sky, far, far, far from that vision and the moon wasn't out. The problem is the moon is up right now. And so it's going to, on its brightest night, on the comet's brightest night, um, it's, it's gonna make it so that you probably wouldn't be able to see it with just naked eye, which means we won't be able to see it with naked eye. Um, it's going to rapidly decrease in brightness. We might be able to get it with this telescope, say, in a week or two. I was gonna say, yeah, like next week, it'll probably be okay. After that, it will also be like more visible in the Southern hemisphere leading up after that. Yeah. Um, just because of where it is, you know, we were looking at how it was traveling south from here now, right? Yeah. Um, so the Southern hemisphere will have a little bit better chance to see it then. It'll be up kind of during the daytime here. Um, but by then it will be definitely really faint, you know, by, by the time you get into like mid-February, it will be uh, definitely really tough to see. Only the biggest telescopes will, will be able to spot it then. Exactly, exactly. And I can tell from the, <laughs> looking at the video going, our telescope is slightly out of focus, but that's okay. It's the, t the, the comet is moving. And so that means everything is going to look smeared. Um, everything else is going to look smeared. Um, yeah, you can especially see it in, the, in this star. Yeah, here. It's, it, it's such a faint one that you can kind of see um, sort of differences in the brightness and things, yep. which wouldn't necessarily be the case if it was uh, in a perfect view. Yeah, we wanted to make sure the comet was as in view as we could. So, um, so yeah, we're willing to forego a little bit of, uh, well, actually, yeah, go right here because I can show you how do we do this. So, you oh, wait, right, yeah, here you go. The focus knob is right here. And actually, if I if I tap the telescope just a little bit while it's taking a picture, you might see a little bit of uh, smearing in the uh, in the picture. So I'm grabbing the focus knob right here, and so one thing that's a little bit different right now with um, the view that we have through the camera that would be different than if you were looking yeah, through good. it is when looking through it with your eye, it's a totally live view, right? Your, your eye is constantly updating. With this, it's a little bit harder um, to tweak some of those things because it is on a longer exposure. What, what exposure did you say it was? Uh, it's about four. Uh, oh, well, there it is. Yeah, right around four seconds. Under four seconds, yeah. Um, and so we're getting a refresh once every four minutes. And, so, and you'll notice it because you'll see, oh, whoops, that's said four minutes. Yeah, sorry. Yes, four seconds. You'll see um, every four seconds, the stars will jump just a little bit. So if we had, you know, live view, like your eyes, you would see those slowly moving down, but because we have that um, sort of time difference. And I'm just reaching here just to... Yeah, you can kind of see the little blue light right here is actually the blue light of the, of the camera that's on there. 
there, I just made it a little bit more out of focus. And I'm going a little bit in the other direction just to see how out of focus it might have been. Seems pretty close. So. We love our telescope. We do love our telescope, yes. And if you also love our telescope and uh, live here in the in the Chicago area, um, any clear Wednesday nights, you can come out and uh, just like this one, you can come out and visit us and actually look through uh, through the telescope yourself, right? Yep, yep. But the um, getting back to the question about when will we not really see it anymore? Yeah, the the most powerful telescopes will probably be able to follow it for quite a bit longer. Um, True. That's actually such a great point that it gets back to like when it when it was discovered, right? So back in um, March of last year, when it was discovered, almost a whole year ago now, trying to remember what the magnitude was, but obviously much, much dimmer than it is now. Um, and a telescope was able to find it, right? So it was discovered at the Zwicky Transient Facility, um, which is a which is an all sky survey. So it basically um, takes a ton of pictures of the entire sky, looking for little changes in light. So that can help detect things like uh, supernovas, right? So stars exploding um, towards the end of their lifespan, things like asteroids and comets. Um, and so uh, that is able to detect it at really, really faint magnitudes, but not something that like the average person would, would really have access to, and you know, not something that you're, that you're looking at frequently. Yeah, so if it was discovered a year ago, I'd say the, the, the telescopes could see it I would presume for another year. True, until about then, probably. Yeah, yeah. until about then. Let's say probably the end of this year. But again, it, it will be getting continually dimmer and dimmer and dimmer yeah. um, throughout that entire time, you know, moving into magnitudes all the way in the, you know, 15s to 20s and, and really, really faint. Exactly. All right. So, oh my goodness. Oh, we've got. Uh, so, wait, wait, we both went really silent. We were reading something that was being typed yeah. in our document here. So, um, <laughs> we want to say a special hello to our amateur astronomy friends in the entire Chicago area. There is the uh, there are quite a few astronomical societies and groups in our area. Special, special, super duper shout out to the Chicago Astronomical Society, um, who's been a partner of the Abbey Planetarium for literally decades. Um, but there are others as well. So, um, but hello, Chicago Astronomical Society folks. We know you're out there. Thanks for watching. Um, but there are others. Uh, we've got the Lake County Astronomical Society, the Skokie Valley Astronomers, the Naperville Astronomical Association, uh, the Northwest Suburban Astronomers, um, and the Chicago Astronomical Society. That's, that's, but Chicago has a wealth of uh, astronomical uh, uh, friends and relatives here. Uh, we've got lots of folks who just love this topic so much. Um, so we encourage you to find an astronomy group in your area. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we had people coming from so many different cities today to watch. And uh, I mean, really pretty much everywhere has, a, has a astronomical societies. And um, they do so much fantastic work getting people uh, opportunities to view the sky. They often have star parties and things that they'll host where a bunch of people will bring out their telescopes have them available for you to come and look through. Um, and you can see some so see some pretty sweet setups at those nights. Um, so definitely encourage you to do that because there's nothing quite like, you know, while the camera view is awesome, there's nothing quite like getting an eyeball on an eyepiece, you know? Exactly. It's, yeah. it's, it's really a cool experience. Yeah, that's right. And um, so it's a really, uh, it's a really amazing thing to be able to share this with you, but we absolutely would love for you to get your eyeball up to our telescope at some point. Um, so yeah, if we're, uh, if it's clear out and it's a Wednesday night, come on down. Um, if you want to join our Facebook group, it's called Scopes at the Adler, and that will uh, help you keep track of when the observatory is open. I believe uh, Scopes in the City uh, announcements are made. Scopes yep, the Scopes Adler. in the City announcements will be made on there. Um, it's really useful for checking if uh, we had to cancel for weather purposes. You know, sometimes it's a rainy on a Wednesday and we got to close up shop. So always a really good place to uh, check before you plan on coming out and visiting us here for one of our telescope events. We just had a thank you from India. You're wow. welcome. You're welcome from Chicago. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Know, that's um, awesome. Yes. And we have another question. Uh, can we calculate where the comet will be in another 50,000 years? Yes, we can. Um, it will be going out. <laughs> it will be yeah. going farther out. Well. <laughs> yeah. So it's just going to get farther and farther from the sun. This comet um, was affected by Jupiter's orbit on this inbound trek. And it either has enough 
speed to escape our solar system completely, or it doesn't quite have enough speed to escape our solar system completely, but it will take even longer for it to go all the way out and then start making its way back in. Mm -hmm. It might be a million years or more. It's, it, it went from a 50,000 year trek to uh, possibly a million years or more. Yeah, maybe it could be just going out into you know interstellar space and yeah. leaving either the solar way, system. Either way, this is literally your last only single chance to see this comet. Is either uh, you saw it through the telescope tonight, or uh, or or you're watching us live uh, from the Don Observatory at the end of planetary. All right. Wow. This is, I don't know about you, but this is- I, I seriously funny. can't believe that no clouds have covered this up the entire time that we've been live. I mean, at the beginning, I, I don't know if any of you were here, I don't know, it's almost an hour ago. Um, we were like panicked, like we started and within like 10 seconds, we had the camera view up because we were worried that uh, we were gonna lose it really soon, that clouds were gonna move in. Exactly. But uh, wow, for the first time in so long, we have gotten so lucky tonight. Yeah, we took, we took um, some uh, uh, camera snapshots earlier because we came out, we had people come into the observatory to take a look. And um, before they got here, we took a few pictures and a couple of video clips because we're like, we want to show something. <laughs> but my God, it's been clear. We've, got, again, we've gotten so lucky. It's just been a, an absolutely fantastic and, view. And if you're just watching it, watching it now, you are seeing a live video view. You're seeing the comet move. The, it isn't the stars on the sides that are moving. It's the comet that's moving. And our telescope is tracking the comet and doing a darn good job of that. It is doing a darn good job. That's so true. So typically the telescope is set up to um, essentially to track the, the Earth's rotation, right? So we're spinning and the stars are moving across the night sky as the Earth rotates, right? And that's the speed that it would typically be set up to track, right? It's usually following that normal trajectory that those things take. For something like a comet that's moving at um, such, a, such a different pace across the night sky, um, you had to, can you explain a little bit about how you were able to, to sort of get it to track that? Yeah. I, was, I, was, I gotta say, I was pretty impressed. Can you, can you bring over the, um, are you able to bring over Oh, actually, you know what? It's on the other. I think I've got it right here. Oh, okay. Here cool. we um, so there's that one. Can you bring over the. the oh, for. That one. That's the one on the left. Okay. Um, actually, yeah, bring over, actually, I'll talk about that one and then we'll bring over that one. Yeah. So, okay. Let me talk about this first. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen is um, what's called an ephemer ephemerides list. I may not be saying that correctly, but close enough. Um, so this is from uh, the Minor Planet Center. And uh, what you're seeing highlighted there is the, is the, uh, the orbital elements, the, the numbers that it takes to describe an orbit of something and describe its path. And so what we do is we highlight that entire line because very smart people have figured out the orbit of this comet. And <laughs> thank then, you, very smart people, you, very all, smart all the very people. smart people out there. And then we bring it into our telescope software. And so Hunter's bringing that over. So this is the telescope software. This is what we use to point the telescope. And so uh, Plane Wave makes, makes, made our telescope and this is their software. What we do is we copy that entire line we bring it into the software. So then you see that the window on the left side, we literally paste it into that top window there. And then we click show on, well, we, we click that it's a comet to tell it if it's a comet. If it's not, it'll recognize it as an asteroid. And so we, it just needs to be in the right format. Um, so we can do comets or asteroids. This is a comet. So you click the comet box, which says show on sky chart. And then we click go to. And then the telescope goes to and points to where the comet is in the sky and it tracks it at the comet's rate of motion, um, not the star, the background star's rate of motion. If we were pointed at just the stars, the comet would do the moving. Okay. Exactly. So you can, if we bring this, this yeah. live view back up, you can see the, the speed that we're seeing the stars move across that, the comet would be moving across at that, yep. at that pace. So we're tracking at the comet speed because we wanted to keep it in view this entire time. So anyway, there you go, behind the scenes. Um, 
So any local Chicago astronomical groups or telescopes to see the comet tomorrow? Not that I'm aware of. I was going to say, and I, I don't know of any other doing it that's going on this week. No, there's uh, the problem tomorrow is it's going to be extremely windy in the Chicago area, like over 20 mile an hour winds. And that is pretty bad for, for seeing something that might be kind of dim. Yeah, so, something this faint, it will be, uh, you know, the telescope's wobbling. And since this is so faint, it would make it, it would definitely make it pretty tough to see. And especially, you know, being in an observatory where the telescope's a little protected definitely helps keep us out away from that wind a lot. Yep. Oh, an interesting question. Um, since there was no light pollution, could the Neanderthals have seen this more clearly back in their day, 50,000 years ago? Um, I was going to say, kind of two ways to answer this, absolutely, and maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> right? So certainly way less light pollution, right? So you can see much more of the night sky, much more likely that you would have been able to see it. We have no idea, you know, what, what this comet looked like the last time it, the, the last time it passed. You know, it's going to be different every time it passes through the inner solar system. You know, it's very difficult to predict. It has a lot to do with just the way that it's interacting with the sun when it goes past. Um, so it's really hard to know what it would have looked like. It also depends on how far would it have been, or any comet that happens to come to this part of the solar system, how far it is from the Earth when it does. Right, so we could have been at a very different point in our orbit. Yeah, it, it, what if the sun was in the sky at the same time or, yeah. or whatever? So yeah, there's a lot of things that can affect whether or not you might see um, you might see a comet in the sky. It's yeah. they're, they're small. They're dim usually, and mm -hmm. so. So in general, yes, they could see a lot more yeah. um, uh, in the night sky, right? You're absolutely right that light pollution affects it a lot, but who knows is, is really the answer for this specific comment yep. in this instance. Oh, someone said it's raining near me, so thank you so much for live streaming. It truly made my day. It made ours that it was clear out because all the forecasts were that it was supposed to cloud up by now. And so we should have been clouded over. We got lucky this um, time, though. We got lucky. All right. So. Oh, oh, that's the last of the questions the that we had here tonight. Last minute questions, guys. We're going to be yes. signing off in a few minutes. Yeah, so. any last minute questions, make yeah. sure to post those in the chat. While you're thinking of any last minute questions um, that you have, I wanted to encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button down below. Um, you know, not only will you be able to see when we're doing future Sky Observers Hangout live streams, um, but a ton of other videos um, that, that we post on there, um, all astronomy related, of course. Um, so definitely hit subscribe down there. And then we will also have, um, Bella will be posting a link to a, uh, a poll in the chat um, with uh, some different sort of survey questions about how, how you thought the experience went today. You can also do fun things like recommend future show topics. Um, so we would really appreciate it if you filled that up for us. Um, that uh, helps us you know, improve our shows, make it a better experience for you and bring you the kind of content that you're looking for exactly. um, about the night sky. Yeah, and later this month, we're gonna try again next Next Wednesday, we we're already looking out going, oh, it might sleep next Wednesday. <laughs> so that might not be a good night to be out here again. Um, but we'll see. We'll keep an eye on the weather. Um, but in February, we're going to keep an eye on uh, Wednesday nights. If it's clear out on another Wednesday night in February, we're just going to do the same thing. And we're going we're gonna to turn the telescope on, turn the camera on, and see whatever it is we can look at. Might not be the comet. It might be, I don't know, the Orion Nebula. True. It could be all kinds of different stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely. Again, like I said, subscribe to the channel to make sure you know if we're going to be doing those live streams. But our next actual schedule will happen, whether it's cloudy or clear, um, because we want to show you a conjunction of two planets in the sky, meaning two planets appearing close together in the sky, um, a conjunction of Venus and Jupiter. It's on Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. And we are have a tentative show start time of I believe it's six o'clock. I, so, yeah. I think it's six o'clock. Um, check their check our YouTube channel. We don't have it up yet on the YouTube channel. We haven't created the stream yet. Um, but it'll be up pretty soon. And so that'll be our next live stream. And we're going to do that one no matter if it's cloudy or clear. We'll show it to you if it's clear. If not, we're going to show you Stellarium and show you exactly. And encourage where you're you to get out and see it with your own eyes because that's one that will definitely be naked eye visible. Yes. Uh, so that's something exciting. About that. Yes. And so just to give you a sense of how close Venus and Jupiter will appear, if you stick your thumb out at arm's length, Venus and Jupiter will be about, 
a quarter the diameter of your thumb away from each other. So that's pretty close. Yeah. But don't spoil too much. Like we gotta make sure they come and see us again on March first, right? Well, I'm hoping they can show you a live camera view too. Not from this telescope. It'll be from my camera. Um, because it'll be uh in a part of the sky where this, where this telescope can't see it. So that's okay. That's all right. We don't we don't need uh, the fancy telescope for that one. So um uh the um uh, and the is it high in the sky or low on the horizon? The conjunction it will be. In the western sky, so it'll be lower. I so. think that question might have been asked before we were talking about the oh. conjunction. So I think it might be referring to the comet. It's actually pretty high in the sky right now. Yeah, it's like I think around sixty degrees up right now. So I guess I can't check. Yeah, I've got yeah. So we'll solarium for the last time. So you can see it's actually sixty-two degrees up in the sky. So you can imagine, you know, ninety degrees is is going to be straight up. So so pretty high up in the sky right now tonight. Yep. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, they confirmed. Yes, the comet. Yes, the comet yeah, is. so yeah. it's 62 degrees up in the sky right now. Yep. So about two thirds of the way up. So if you go face north, look about two thirds of the way up. There it is. Well, if you have a telescope and you can actually there point it be, there, yeah. you don't see it. Um, the next big celestial event that we should know about. Well, we've got yes, the conjunction. The conjunction is going to yeah. be a big one. Yep. Yeah. Oh, but, but get ready, everyone. There's two big celestial events coming Oh, up. boy. I know what you're going to be mentioning. Saturday, October 14th, 2023, a solar eclipse. It will be the, the sun from here in Chicago will be about 42% covered by the moon. And then Monday, April 8th, 2024, from Chicago, about 94% of the sun will be covered by the moon. This is That is a total solar eclipse. We're not here in the path of totality. Other places will be in the path of totality. Um, but uh, we cannot wait. Mark your calendars, please. Saturday, October 14th, 2023. Monday, April 8th, 2024. If you remember the craziness of 2017, we get to do it all over again. <laughs> oh, and I can't imagine uh, craziness that I would oh, enjoy it's so more. Cool. It's so cool. Can't wait. All right. I see the last two quick questions that we have here before we, uh, before we sign off for the night. Could you go near it on a spaceship? So it is like, it is like technically close enough that you could go near it on a spaceship. Yeah. We, we didn't really know about it soon enough to send something up, right? So it's traveling so fast right now. It's going 128,000 miles at Earth. 138 maybe was the number that we had earlier. I think it's, it's going really, really fast. Really fast. Yeah. yeah. So, really fast. However, um, there is a mission that I believe the European Space Agency is interested in uh, putting up, which in the next few years, which will essentially be a spacecraft, but it'll just be kind of in a parking orbit so that when we do find a comet and we go, oh, this would be a cool one to go see. We haven't seen this one before. Go send the spacecraft up there. It'll be ready to go, essentially. Um, but a year is too little time to design a spacecraft, send it, get it up there, get it to the comet, all that. So exactly. they want to put something up there ready to go for the next whatever comet is that they may want to go study. Um, so, and then yes, you could go near it on a spaceship as long as you are not so close and going so fast that you are impacted by all the little little dust particles. And things. Right, true. So, yeah, like, yeah. like the, the tail has a lot of stuff that could hit your space. Exactly. So you just have to do a, 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 good, uh, a good flyby. There was a spacecraft, that, uh, an American spacecraft, that flew past the comet and actually collected a bit of material from it and brought that material back to Earth. Um, it wasn't Genesis. It was a spacecraft whose name completely escapes me. That hopefully Geza will put in the name, put the name in the chat. Anyway, um, thank you, Geza, because I know you yes, want the name in the chat. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> oh, we had a great comment. I'll get to the to that other question in just a second. I'm young and very interested in astronomy. This live stream, since it was cloudy near me, let me see this for real. Thank you. That's exactly what we hope to do here. And uh, so I'm so glad that it can. Hopefully, encourage you to continue doing, uh, continue looking up, yep. continue connecting with space. Uh, that's what we live for. And what temperature is the comet? Extremely cold. <laughs> so um, it would probably depend on which part of the comet is currently facing the sun or not. But true, right? Yeah. And how close it is to the sun, right? And then exactly. certainly the temperature has been changing, right? It was all totally, uh, you know, frozen. Now it's gotten closer. Some of that has melted, released yep. the gas. So. Pretty variable throughout. So you could probably probably easily say that the shadowed parts of this comet are 
probably several hundred degrees below zero right now. Yep, easily. Certainly. Yep. So, all right. Oh, did you have fun? I had an absolute blast. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, like I said, Bella, we'll uh, post that. Uh, we'll post that feedback survey in the comments. We'd really appreciate it if you um, filled that out for us. Let us know how we were doing. Let us know what you're interested in seeing. And uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel down below. Other than that, I think we're uh, we're going to sign off here, sign right? Up here. Thank you so much, we'll, everyone. We'll leave you with a few more seconds of comment views. Yep. Um, and then uh, we'll see you next time on Sky yep. Observers Hangout. Thank you so much. We're going to leave the camera view live. We're going to turn ourselves off. Thank you. Thank you. Join us next time. Have a great night, everybody.